You are listening to Fantasy Film Ball with Matt and Dylan, and on this show, we turn movies into sports and look at all the Oscar prospects and their fantasy value. I believe that this is going to win Best Picture, and here's why. I mean, Denis Villeneuve got all the nominations he needed for Do It and still missed out on the Best Director slot. Don't let me get my hopes up. The Academy has disappointed me too many times. Thank you to the Academy. Thank you to all of you in this room. I can't remember the last time I walked out of the movie theater on such a high. No matter how certain it seems, anything can happen on nominations morning. Never count the Golden Globes for just doing something off the walls and bonkers. It's the kind of movie that reminds me of why I fell in love with movies. And the Oscar goes to... Welcome into episode 23 of Fantasy Film Ball. My name is Dill. And my name is Matt. And this is a show where we turn movies and this week music into sports and sports into something that we don't talk about here. We're going to be talking about the Grammys today as well as some movies that we watched this week as always. Giving you our thoughts on everything. But Dylan, how are you doing this week? What's new? You know, I've had some ups. I've had some downs. But I'm ready for this to be one of the highlights of the week. Because like Matt mentioned, we have a lot to go over. Whether it's one of the three movies. Whether it's the whole Grammy Awards. Because that is something as it is every year. But um, overall, I would say I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good, man. I, I mean, it's Grammy Award nominations week is always an interesting one. Because it just gets me like listening to a bunch of music that I've never heard of before. And some stuff that I have heard of, and I'm very confused why people like it. But yeah, my week's been pretty good. But anyways, let's start off with that question, as we always do. Now, comment below, leave your answer to this. We want to know what your favorite album of the past Grammy year has been. I guess I'll start. My favorite album of the past year has been Ants From Up There by Black Country New Road. Uh, which is just a fantastic album, and I think it like instantly became one of my favorite records of all time. Uh, but I'd say, honestly, my, my second favorite album of the year is Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, which did get a Grammy nomination, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, the Grammys do love Kendrick, so I'm, I'm not surprised at all. But um, yeah, he's, he's going to lose again, and that's fine, because Beyonce is also great, and Beyonce does deserve that album of the year victory. But what about you, Dylan? Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to guess yours. You probably Don can get it FM. right. Don yep. FM. Yeah. Pr- That's your pretty favorite. Pretty easy. Year, right? Exactly, yes. Uh, that album came out the first week of the year, and it's just stay number one. Every year I make a playlist on like my Apple Music, and it's like top ten albums of the year, and I fill them in as the year goes. And just Don stayed at number one. I put the, my favorite song from each album in. It stayed like that the whole year. Renaissance what's, from Beyonce. What's your favorite Is song it- from Don FM? See, that's a really, really hard question because Gasoline starts the album off so well. Take My Breath is just like the perfect, like, I'm a god, like, the lights are on me sort of song. Less Than Zero is great. There's just Sacrifice is good. There's so many just good ones on the album, like the whole album. I love an album that flows, and this album flows. And the other album that really flows that came out this year was Renaissance from Beyonce, which would be my runner-up and my personal pick from the Grammys album of the year lineup. I know that you say Kendrick would be yours, which is another... Very good album, but uh, Beyonce. Be- Beyonce would be my second choice, though. She's fantastic. Exactly. I think this is my favorite Beyonce album, and I really like some of her albums. Like Self Titled was my favorite before better, Lemonade. Better really than good. Lemonade. I think Renaissance is well on its way to becoming a classic. I think this is going to be the album to finally get Beyonce her album of the year win. Adele's here, so she could stop her for a third time in a row. Hopefully no. not. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> also, okay. Before we move on, let's just talk Don FM because Don FM was ineligible because the weekend like withdrew it from competition in protest of the fact that After Hours did not get nominated for anything. But like which I don't know. It that feels a bit weird to me because it kind of feels like if can you imagine Denis Villeneuve not submitting Dune 2 to the Oscars because he was salty about missing a directing nomination for the first film? Like, it, it's kind of giving me the same thing. Although, that said, I will say there's a lot more factors at play with the Grammys because they really do need to be torn down and rebuilt uh, to really put a- and center artists who, like, what artists in specific genres appreciate from their own genre rather than being just, like, <laughs> what do a bunch of old white dudes appreciate from every genre? Because then you get DJ Khaled in the fucking hip-hop category. God so, did. Like, Oh my god. Um, but yeah, no. What do you think about Abel withdrawing Don FM because 
he's upset about after hours i think i agree i think it's kind of dumb but i get why because like it wasn't just they snubbed him it was they were going to nominate him he was confirmed to be a musical guest but then he got the super bowl invitation and he had to pick the grammys wouldn't let him do both they said you can't do the same performance that you're gonna do at the super bowl here we want something completely different and he was like well i'm gonna do the super bowl and i hope that i can still do this if y'all let me and instead of like responding to him or anything they just didn't nominate him and that's why the whole grammy shift happened after the awards because he publicly was like hey here's like the stuff that happened um do it for what you want i'm no longer submitting i'm joining other artists like frank ocean who does not submit music yeah. um i know jay-z in the past frank ocean also stuff doesn't sometimes. make music so <laughs> that is true too but frank ocean was a grammy nominated musician for album of the year with channel orange and then blonde came around the same year that beyonce was back with lemonade uh, he just didn't submit, and some people yeah. thought maybe Beyonce would follow up, and because a lot of artists around that time were still like, I don't know if we can support because of all like the stuff happening inside the Grammys. And once the weekend kind of like, well, here's what happened with me. They basically told me I was nominated and that they wanted me to perform, but I couldn't do the same set at the Super Bowl, and they didn't want me to do both because they were back to back weekends. So they thought they were gonna get like the my like seconds or like, my leftovers. So instead of just not having him perform. Or just having him perform something a little bit different. They just uh, took his name off of all the categories. Mm. And then the year after the Grammys, we're like, okay, we're going to take away these secret last-minute uh, categories. Because like, if you looked at some of the nominations last year, like Taylor Swift and Kanye and the album of the year, their names were not in alphabetical order. They were just 9 and 10. And that's because they were handpicked by the selection committees to be in album of the year. They had the 8 first in ABC order, and they took them to out hand print because the taylor album got no other nominations besides album of the year and donda just got some like rap nominations and, but they're like you know what we should put these people in album of the year even though it's not abc order they're going to be nine and ten and also honestly, what an I... awful choice to put in for one of your last slots for donda like i i don't know i think you like donda much more than i do but i think that is uh just a showcase of kanye's downfall um uh, mm-hmm really not a good album but yeah i mean i i think this is the biggest problem with the grammys is that there's so very i mean it just it seems like a shady committee being like these are our favorites instead of it being what the oscars are which is the oscars are industry members deciding who the best in each of their fields are like you've got makeup artists voting for makeup artists you've got costume designers voting for costume designers you got actors voting for actors to nominate their picks for for what they truly believe are the best in their field but it doesn't seem like the grammys are that way it really doesn't feel like that there's no way in my mind that a bunch i'm going back to the hip-hop category there's no way that all of the biggest names in hip-hop music in the industry voted and decided that out of all of the industry giants that released this year denzel curry black star uh so many more that are just not coming to mind right now as i blank how did everyone get together and unanimously decide or whatever or the votes count uh, came out to show that jack harlow and dj khaled had two of the five best rap albums of the year that doesn't feel like people voting in their field that feels like people who know nothing about hip-hop music voting or like uh, with the rock categories it's always like bands that are like 30 years past their prime are in there when there's so many great rock albums that are released every year like my favorite album of the year uh, ants from up there was not nominated in any of the rock categories when it's like yeah <laughs> that totally should have been there over mm-hmm. like i don't know were the red hot chili peppers there i feel like they're there i think so yeah because like here's the thing with the grammys i found this out about a year or two ago you can vote wherever you want it doesn't have to be just in your genre you just get to vote. I, th- I forgot how many categories it is. You have to vote in. It's like 10 or something like that categories. But you can vote anywhere you want. You could be a hip-hop musician. And you're like, you know what? I'm voting for five country categories and three jazz and then album and record of the year. And don't quote me on the number of categories, but mm-hmm. I remember reading an article when the whole like 
after hour stuff happen and it was like people like grammy voters being like here's how i vote sort of thing and it's like it would make sense like what matt's saying of like okay the people who've been nominated for hip hop get to vote in the hip hop categories. People who've been nominated for country get to no- or get to vote in the country categories. But no, you can vote wherever you want, nominate whatever you want in any categories you want. So theoretically, you can nominate ten hip hop albums for album of the year, ten country albums, ten whatever. It doesn't mean it's gonna go through. You can nominate your own stuff. You can do whatever you want. It's not like the Oscars where it's like the costume designers just vote on costumes. Yeah, when it's for to pick the winner, everyone votes. But for nominations, yeah. I fully believe that the people or the industry or the uh, members of that specific genre should vote there then everyone can do the um, album and record of the year just the, what I guess what makes it so difficult for music is people who break genres whether that is a Beyonce who's traditionally in a pop or an R&B field who's now in a dance field how would you correlate that or to someone like Tyler the Creator from a few years ago whose album may be hip hop on the surface but the artists themselves are saying this is not a hip hop album then I feel like you should go based on how the artists and the labels are pushing the album. If the labels are pushing as a pop album, then you should make it a pop album compared to if the artist is traditionally one genre. That's one thing with Drake I always find so interesting is his albums, yeah, are hip hop, but they're more pop and they put they're pushed as pop but continuously shows up in the hip hop category. When he wants to be nominated, we saw last year he just didn't want to be nominated, so he withdrew all his nominations after they were nominated. So the hip hop categories had four nominations instead of five for song and album. He could have just not submitted. Kind of feels like he was going out of his way to, to do that. Anyways, we'll, we'll get back to Grammys in just a little bit because we are a movie podcast, we are an Oscar podcast, and we've got some news this week. Specifically, we finally have reactions for Babylon. And they're all over the place. Dylan, do you want to take us through what are these uh, this Babylon reactions doing? So, I think if you ask anyone for the past few months, what are your thoughts on Babylon? What do you think the movie's going to be like? Most people would be like, it's going to be super bombastic, in your face, insane, and crazy. And that's exactly what the movie sounds like it is. Just when you describe that movie, that movie doesn't sound like it's for everyone. And clearly the reactions are showing that. There's some people who are head over the moon saying, this is my favorite movie of the year. Margot Robbie's my favorite actress of the year. Calva's a star in the making. The, The technicals are top notch and there's other people saying damon chazelle created a mess this is awful horrible this shouldn't be nominated anywhere this maybe could just get one tech maybe two techs but no i would not recommend this movie and that's just the spectrum we're seeing with this and we haven't seen a movie get this type of reaction this season at all i don't think i don't think there's been this much of a divide because there's some movies you could point to like an elvis maybe but an elvis still is People can at least pick out, like, oh, I still like this aspect of it, even if they don't like the whole movie. But Babylon's seeming like the people who hate it don't like a single thing. And the people who love it don't have a single thing wrong with it sort of thing. Well, it's it's following in the tradition of last year where we got Don't Look Up and Nightmare Alley both at the last minute. Both got a lot of people saying that they absolutely loved it and it was one of their favorite things of the entire year. And a lot of people saying that it was absolutely awful. And... I know I was very high up on Don't Look Up last year, and I was really high up on the script of Don't Look Up in advance, too, and it met my expectations of what I wanted out of that movie, having read the screenplay in advance. I've also read the Babylon screenplay, and everything that I'm hearing is the same thing, where I'm like, okay, this sounds like stuff that I I love, I know I liked it on the page, I know it's going to work for me on the screen. I know that there's a lot of people out there, especially on like Reddit, Uh, or other internet forums who have also read the script and feel very differently to how I feel. And those people are are not going to like the movie. And this is something that we've seen. I don't know why everyone was expecting Babylon to be some unanimous crowd pleaser, because it's not. It's really not. It's a really (laughs) offensively raunchy film. And it's going to, it's going to put some people off no matter what. And the, there was like a bit of a meltdown on on film Twitter and Reddit where people were going crazy being like, oh my god, Babylon's failing, Babylon's failing, it's not getting in, it's not getting in, it's not getting in. And that's just such a massive overreaction because we saw two of these movies last year, movies that had immense hype, Don't Look Up and Nightmare Alley, which premiered, got mixed reactions. Some people loved it, some people hated it, and they got in anyways. So... Babylon's too big to fail, and it's still in, no matter what, and you might like it, you might not like it, but 
that is not going to determine whether this makes it in. This is making it in. It's such a big film. It is too big to fail. Um, but how has it been hurt in all of its categories? Because through the season, we've been saying like, oh, Babylon, this is the nominations leader. It's going to have like 12 nominations. Um, probably not anymore is what I'd say. I mean, we saw last year with Nightmare Alley that got like, what? three or four five five, nom- four or five something like that mm. i'll count in my head while you talk okay and then don't look up also underperformed uh from what it would have been expected to have like before it premiered but generally i'd say in picture babylon's still safe uh i i still have it in the top 10 but that said it's below tar for me now it's fighting for that like seventh or eighth slot with the next few films there but i think it's solidly still in now director i did have damien chazelle at number two but i've now got damien chazelle fighting for that fifth slot i don't think damien chazelle is gonna get in uh, with this reception he might make it into like dga and then get cut what do you think about damien chazelle and director now i think that instead of being at two or three like a lot of people had had him I think he's now, like you're mentioning, on that borderline. I think this really helps Sarah Polly become a definite top three, top four director. This helps Martin McDonough's case with how much unanimous praise Banshees has been getting. This helps Daniels even for everything everywhere. While it's still an out-there movie, it's a more well-received out-there movie than Babylon has been so far. And for a personal speaking, this really helps James Cameron because this will be... That allows Way of Water to be the big, bombastic technical movie of the year that gets into director because um while this discussions of joseph kaczynski could get dga i don't really think he's gonna get the oscar and a uh, babylon's dropping that leaves in another open spot i think right now there's two people confirmed for director i think spielberg's in i think polly's in everything after that i think is open in the past we've been saying oh it's it's spielberg it's chazelle it's polly that's a three confirmed that's two spots now i think we have three open spots yeah and with you and Cameron, it's it reminds me of those memes of like Bernie can still. Here's how Bernie can still win from like 2016, where people yeah. would just post like it was like eight months into the Trump administration, people were still posting. Here's how Bernie can still win. And that's hey, that's the, how I. <laughs> the way of water advertisement has just started today alone. Watching TV, um, I've seen like four ads for it in two commercial breaks. Whether well, it's actual ads or product placement ads of cars or with uh, this or with that. So the the ad campaign is starting off. People will see this movie. It's three hours and 12 minutes. What's the last James Cameron movie that was that long? And what, what did he win for that? He won picture. He won director. He won a lot of awards. But speaking of awards, uh, Don't Look Up had four Oscar nominations. It was okay. picture, editing, uh, score and screenplay and Nightmare Alley also had four which was for picture production design costumes and cinematography and obviously neither film won any will Babylon have the same fate I think Babylon will at least win one but if you had to pick one maybe two categories that you think Babylon still is a number oh. one or number two competitor for what would it be I'm gonna say my I've got I, I switched some things around today I'm gonna say right now I think Babylon wins score I think it wins production design before the past few days i would have said it wins costumes as well but i think three wins for a film this divisive it's a bit of a tall order and so i'm saying that uh, costumes now goes to elvis but otherwise i mean i i still think robbie's in uh i think calva actually has become stronger after the nominations diego calva has been getting uh, some great reviews after that first screening so i feel like he could fit into the top five but you know who I'm not seeing any reactions? Brad Pitt. None. No positive, no negative. I just don't see him in those reactions. I've seen a few people say Brad Pitt was their favorite, but I also agree it hasn't been as widely speaking as Calva's support or Robbie's support. Where no. I think even with the people who aren't, I know I just said a few minutes ago with this movie, people that aren't fans of it still like have nothing positive. I've still seen some people who are so negative be like, oh, well, Robbie's good. She's exactly what I wanted from this role. Um, so mm-hmm. I think it'll be really interesting to see how this movie just plays across the board because I still think there's a chance where this movie could get eight nominations or it could be a very base level four, five, but it's very win competitive in all those fields of like what you just mentioned of score, sound, production, costumes, where maybe it's not going to win 
sound, but it's still maybe two or three instead of it being the definitive number one. You know what I think it's actually on the edge of now, which I thought all year was just locked, is original screenplay. Mm -hmm. Original screenplay is like the most interesting category now because you've got a very clear top four. You've got everything ever all at once, Banshees, Fablemans, Tar, and then slot five is now Babylon or Triangle of Sadness. You'd say Bardo, but yes, I I saw Bardo today. Bardo is not happening in screenplay. Bardo sweep. We'll, we it's will a state talk of about mind. we'll talk about Bardo next week when you see it. But it is not happening in screenplay. It is well, not happening in screenplay. There's another movie that maybe makes a little bit more sense for screenplay that we have both seen that a lot of people are still out there predicting because they're like, well. There's a chance in the original screenplay, especially now with Babylon clearing, and that's the decision to leave. A movie I just saw, a movie that you've Ooh. seen twice now, and I think it's a very script-heavy movie, but I also think that could be its its fault for a nomination where it's too much of a screenplay movie where it could be a little bit over the majority of people's heads that they would think the first time, like, this is a really good script, but I don't get it. And will that help for a nomination or will that hurt because people are like, well, I have to watch it again to really understand. I didn't think of it as a as a screenplay contender, but actually, no, you're right. I, I think I have it at my like number eight slot, but it's it's pretty comfortably like out of the running for me because I I don't see this as being like a screenplay contender for the Oscars because of what you said. It's so dense and so complex, and it does require multiple viewings. But overall, what what I saw this a while ago, and then I saw it for a second time in theaters recently. So I've seen it twice. I've really f sat with it, really thought about it. But what do you think on this film? And what's your first impression? Because I know for me, it took me two viewings to like really get into it. Mm -hmm. I would say the first way to describe this movie would be it was funny. I wasn't expecting it to be so funny and so comedic in moments. Uh, and I really appreciated it with that, with Decision to Leave, because of how dark and deep some of the themes and some of the topics can be in one moment and then you have some characters that aren't strict comedic relief characters but when they're on screen like okay they're gonna give me something whether it's the detective sidekick or even our two main characters they have occasional funny beats to combat all the dramatics and all the intensity that can happen throughout but i really enjoyed decision to leave it's one that i was not not looking forward to but also wasn't like the top of my most anticipated list but it's one yeah, I'm as very you can interested tell by the again. fact that uh it took a month for us to get around to this episode from Decision to Leave's initial release. Hey, it, it just opened this week here. So, really? Wow. Yes. Uh, I saw it, it opened, what, last Friday? So I saw it on Thursday? Wednesday? Wednesday. No, Thursday. I saw it on Thursday. So I saw it like two days after I was supposed to see it. I think it was going to originally go on Tuesday, and I just kept... Like, ah, I don't know. I'm like, I want to see it, but I'm just not so eager. And then I went on Thursday and I, I really liked it. I was also the only person in my theater, which made it a very cool experience, too. Like, I'm oh, watching this. That's sad, this. though. That's sad for a movie in its first week of release. It was also at noon um, on a Thursday uh, afternoon. Yeah, but that, uh, that explains it. But yeah, so I don't know. We've talked about this before, whether it was Triangle of Sadness or even Bardo, too, because Bardo. For me to see it, I had to go a little bit out of my way just because of how hard some of these movies can be to see, which stinks because these are movies that should be seen in like a theater. Like, While maybe I didn't like Wakanda Forever the most, it's not one that needs to have 25 plus screens on a weekend. You can give one screen to Bardo or one screen to Decision to Leave. But Decision to Leave, I thought was very good. I really liked it. Did I like it as much as some past huge international contenders for the Oscars? Maybe not so much, but a repeat viewing could very much help my experience. How do you feel like this compares to maybe not just for in terms of its film quality, but for award season with like a Drive My Car or with a Parasite or with a Roma or even another round? Some movies that did hit picture and some movies that didn't make picture. Yeah, so in terms of like Oscar chances for this movie, I think, look, I would love to see this make it into some of these categories. And currently I do have it in... I have it as my winner in international and I have it. Uh, I have Park Chan-wook as my number five for best director. But that said, like Park Chan-wook is very vulnerable there. And I know that a lot of people have said this year, like, Oh, who's going to be the international nominee? Like, could it be Park Chan-wook? And I don't think we need an international nominee 
Um, but that said, he has he has a good path there because he's going to get nominated for the BAFTA. He will be on people's minds. And the director's branch, they admire him. Uh, and this is like the first time they've really been able to give him his roses. So I don't know. Overall, I guess what I'd say about this film and about people who are really hyped is that at, for this as a potential best picture contender, best director contender, even international win, what I would say and why I don't think people are predicting this as highly as um, as they were some of the, the films that were mentioned before, Parasite, Drive My Car, those films had unanimous praise on review aggregate websites for users. Like on IMDb, Parasite had like an 8.9 on IMDb through award season. Drive My Car had an 8.1. Decision to Leave has a 7.3, which really shows how audiences are reacting to this. Yes, it has like an 85, 86 on Metacritic, but that's that's also not close to what Parasite had. I think it's reasonably close to what Drive My Car had, but still, Drive My Car made it into the Oscars off the back of the fact that it was Obama's favorite movie of the year, and he made it known that it was his favorite movie of the year. It uh, won the Golden Globe, it um, won every single trifecta award. So it won the National Society for Film Critics, it won the uh, New York Film Critics Circle, and the Los Angeles Film Critics Circle. So when you win those three prizes, it becomes pretty impossible for people to ignore the film. And Decision to Leave, it's not going to have that. Can it win international? It can. Uh, can it get that director nomination like Thomas Vinterberg did, like Pavel Pavlikovsky did? It can, but it's not a certainty. Like, even last year with Ryosuke Hamaguchi, that was an uphill climb. That, like, lest we forget, on nominations morning, I had, like, convinced myself not to be too into Drive My Car because I didn't want to be heavily disappointed. Um, and I just don't think that Decision to Leave has the same pull for oscar voters that those films did but anything can happen we'll have to we'll have to wait to see what critics awards do we'll have to wait to see who knows maybe obama starts another train for this movie and is like yeah decision to leave is the best movie of the year and uh then it could spiral into something but that's that's what i say what do you think dylan for its its chances at the oscars i think for its realistic chances for me i'm a little bit lower i think it's just international I don't. I think there's other movies that would fit more for a director slot because if you look at those trend of international directors who make it in, they usually have something else attached to them. Vinterberg had a screenplay attached to him. Uh, Pawlikowski had cinematography attached to him, and then the other ones like with Drive My Car, Parasite, Roma, obviously were big uh, picture players or had a lot of buzz for Drive My Car. And this movie, as you just mentioned, doesn't really have those things at least at this moment right now. The international race is one, just like documentary, that can change in like a snap, where one week clearly it's this movie that's head and shoulders above number one, and another week is like, oh, that movie's now at five. It's no longer our top. It's so interchangeable. And I think this year, which is something we haven't seen in international in a while, is going to, I think it's going to be a revolving door, like how Best Actress was last year. Like each ceremony had like a different winner. I feel that's going to be international this year with like, the Globes could go with maybe a Bardo, or BAFTA goes with Decision to Leave, or uh, this critics group goes with Close, or this one goes with All Quiet, and who knows, some random other international movies could come in there as well and play spoiler. And I just think it'll be very interesting to see what movie at the end of the day has the most international wins, because I feel like those four that I just mentioned are, I think, pretty solid to get in unless one gets a huge snub or just Buzz completely dies for. And, and at the snub moment, is always I could... possible here. Like, snubs it is, are, that... they happen. They do, and then I also think that there's a chance where Decision Leave could get a uh, director nomination along with it, or maybe a screenplay or something, and then Close could maybe just be a one nomination, and All Quiet could get a few texts, and Bardo could get a cinematography, and maybe a uh, director, or maybe a lead actor, but probably not with Babylon and Calvary rising back up. But from not the Bardo bias here, but just from looking at people's reviews of Bardo, everyone says they love the cinematography and they love Cacho. So oh, yeah. I haven't written off Cacho completely yet, but he's still not in my top six. Cinematography, Bardo's 
I think Bardo's winning cinematography. But, I mean, this is not a Bardo talk, but we'll talk about that next week. Yes. Uh, but Bardo Bardo's talk winning. done. No more Bardo mentions today. Yeah. Um, until predictions. Then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Bardo there. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think you're, you're totally right about the fact that, like, yeah, some of these past uh, nominees for director, they have had some other stuff in their package, which kind of makes it so that the film is a little bit more seen. And, yeah, what else could this get? But in an ideal world, where would this be nominated? And to me, outside of director, I would love to see Decision to Leave make it into editing, make it into production design. Oh my god, the wallpapers, the, the motifs around, like, the waves on the walls and everything. It's just so... I don't know. If, if I could nominate this movie anywhere at the Oscars, it would be editing and production design. For me, I would be a little bit different. Tang Wei for Best Lead Actress would be my one. Yeah. I really want this in. Um, I think we've seen Category Fraud with other movies, like the movie we'll talk about next. And I think you could maybe Category Fraud her way into supporting. And if that happened, mm. she would be my winner. Um, but obviously that's all hypothetical because we've seen the Oscars very much do not like to inter uh, nominate international performances unless they're a either a staple like Penelope Cruz last year or they're from a movie that received so many nominations like with Roma. And mm -hmm. this is neither of those. So uh, that would be my one like dream nomination for this film. I like the screenplay She's as well. Incredible. At the moment, it's in my personal five favorite original screenplays, but by the end of the year, I think we'll probably end up dropping out. Because right now it's at like my four or five slot and there's still mm -hmm. a few more international, not international, but original screenplay movies that I still have to see. Right, right. Okay, we're, we're gonna get into some spoiler territory here, so. If you have not seen Decision to Leave, please skip ahead. Dear Lord, because we are... I, I'm about to spoil the shit out of this movie. Um, so, please, if you do... Uh, if, if, you, if you haven't seen this movie yet, and you want to see it, which you should, because it's a good movie, skip ahead. Um, what do you think about the ending? Because, to me, the ending on the first watch, I was a little bit after thinking about it afterwards i got it but the ending was a little bit weird for me at first but on a second watch i thought the ending was absolutely beautiful um so what did you take away from the ending before i get into like all my my thoughts on it yeah i definitely agree i've only seen it one time and i was left a little bit cold i think i really know not i think i really but i think i know what they were going with um my one, I guess, big issue with the movie, I still gave it like a very solid 8 out of 10, but it would be, it feels like there's four or five different endings and they keep going. And like, you feel like, okay, the movie's done, we've resolved, and then the movie's like, actually, guess what? We have another 10 minutes. And then the next, like, pseudo ending happens, and then it's like, okay, well, another 15. And like, the first few times it didn't bother me, because like, the first ending was when they solved the first case. And like, okay, this movie really flew by the wow, that was quick. And then like, oh, well, there's more story, obviously. And then the second ending happens, uh, around the time when he moves not moves but after he first meets uh us uh, um sorry so ray again and you're like okay well that's a interesting like conclusion and then the second murder happens like oh okay and then they somewhat solve that case and then there's another ending which is the actual ending of the movie and i don't know to me it felt like there was three or four endings which continuously worked a little bit less for me but i still really enjoyed it and i think what they're going for with the the themes of like never finding true happiness and being stuck on that person sort of thing but obviously you've seen it twice so you can probably speak a little bit more because you've been able to see it play out once and then watch it want to rewatch be like okay well now i know what happened so where are like the keys or the little hidden mysteries throughout the movie i actually find with a lot of movies and decision to leave i really felt this with I find a lot of the time when watching a movie for the first time if you're unspoiled for a movie um it can actually be less enjoyable than when you actually know where the story goes because you're thinking so much you're trying to be a few steps ahead of the story you're thinking of everything you're especially with a park chan wook movie like decision to leave it leaves you in the dark for a lot of it so a lot of the time you're playing catch up with with what the movie is doing and so the second time around it really allowed me to like focus on the little details and not think of it as a puzzle in that, like, I have to solve what's going on in the story or whatever, but instead think of it as a puzzle where you get to delve a little bit deeper into every single moment and idea that there uh, there is. Like, on the second watch, uh, did you see in the waves at the very end, it becomes, the waves become her face? 
I did not see that. It's insane. It's insane. There's, um, it's the moment where it goes overhead and there's the road in the middle and the, the waves are crashing on the shore. The waves become an outline of Tang Wei's face. Um, but overall, I mean, the first time that I watched it, I was definitely a little bit confused by, like, why, why did she choose to bury herself in the sand? Um, like, what, what does that kind of signify? And then I thought about it more and I was like, okay... I guess it's it's like she wants to be one of his unsolved cases and then the second time that i saw it it was just like it ties into the soap operas that she's watching throughout um because she she has obsessed with soap operas and the way that these people on soap operas have undying love they have this romance that goes on forever and is just you know um undefeatable by by anything and she's never experienced that type of love before until uh hey june the detective comes in but she has witnessed that he only loves her when he has to focus on her as though mm -hmm. she's a puzzle to solve because he's got his wall of unsolved cases and once the first case was solved he disappeared and the second time there's a new case and he's back in her life because of that and she knows that if she remains one of his unsolved mysteries forever then she'll experience that that undying love that undying obsession that she has seen on all of these uh soap operas and you know k-dramas that she watches she'll forever be chased after and in that way their love will be eternal forever um which is like it's a very it's a very Park Chan look, very like twisted way to do a romance where you've got the main character killing herself so that the other character will love her forever because he'll be chasing after her forever uh, because she's just forever going to be this loose end that he needs to to solve. Um, but that kind of goes to the humor of the film. It's really it's twisted and funny and pretty dark, but sweet at the same time in like a very odd way yeah well we go from talking about someone who i would want to win supporting actress to someone that you think will win supporting actress because you finally got to see I do. she said and you think that i think pretty boldly is a is a big claim because it's something i was saying before i saw the movie when i saw i was like no way she can win but you think yeah. carrie mulligan can win best supporting actress let's yeah. hear your case so last week you were you came in being like oh no way is she winning not not a damn chance and i'm here to say no i i do think that i'm i'm not gonna say a hundred percent she will win but i think that any any other year carrie mulligan would not win for this role the supporting actress category is really thin this year it's really undeniably thin this year i mean we lost michelle williams in this category um it is it's a brutal brutal category not because there's a lot of great performances, but because there's a, no one has everything it takes. Because the way that I see it, there are three contributing factors to a win in, a, in any acting category. Uh, and those are having a substantial role. It's really hard to win without a role that feels very big and leaves people thinking about that role in the film. That goes for lead categories, and supporting categories, which is why a lot of the time we see people who have category frauded into supporting win the award, like Daniel Kaluuya or Mahershala Ali in Green Book. Um, number two thing that's very important is big emotions. Uh, it's incredibly hard to win an Oscar without having the scene, the scene where you shout and cry and you want to have those moments. And the third thing that really helps for an Oscar win is a narrative when you've been up for the award enough times and you know you've earned it at this point you've earned it and the way i see it really i think you need two of these things to win you need two and this year uh in most of the other categories we have people who have like for example uh kei hui kwan has a substantial role has big emotions in the role has a narrative to win uh, in lead actor, we've got 
two people who actually uh, actually i wouldn't say that in lead actor i would say colin farrell has a substantial role he does not have big emotions but he has a narrative brendan fraser has all three he has a substantial role big emotions and a narrative while austin butler has a substantial role and big emotions but no narrative meanwhile in supporting actress um what do we have no one has all three no one even has two carrie condon has a substantial role doesn't have big emotions doesn't have a narrative claire foy does not have a substantial role has big emotions has no narrative buckley has does not have a substantial role does not have many big emotions she has a few big scenes in there but not many big emotions um but she has a narrative because she's been nominated before and people really are warming up to her actually i'd say she has not much of a narrative mulligan has everything mulligan has a category frauded co-lead role which is in supporting uh so it's a very substantial role it's the biggest role in this category she has big emotion she spends a lot of the beginning of the film crying uh anytime anyone raises their voice in this movie it's carrie mulligan she's yelling she yells at the guy in the bar she tells him to fuck off smashes a bottle whatever um she has a lot of like yelling and crying on the phone scenes and she has a narrative she lost for promising young, young woman um she is this really at this point she's a giant in the film industry who has not won her oscar she has all three and she's the only person who does so you know do would she win any other year i really don't think so but at this point um, I'm going to put her in until she starts losing the televised awards, and then I'll just shift to whoever is winning them. If Carrie Condon does end up winning all of the awards, I'll shift to her. If Claire Foy ends up running away with stuff, she's undoubtedly my pick because she's my favorite in the category. So, but at, at this point, Mulligan is there because no one else fits it for me. See, Sony could have just saved us all the issue if they just put Viola Davis into supporting and then we would have our clear front runner um, for Woman King, but we yeah. don't have that, and that's what I think sparks this great discussion because you mentioned here that you think Mulligan has a lot of scenes. I think that she has like one, like the in the bar where she's shouting. The rest of the time, she's very subdued and very reserved. You don't and... think all of her postpartum depression scenes are big, like the ones where she's sitting with her husband, she's on the phone, she's crying, she's holding her baby, and just weeping. Like that it's... to me felt but... like Oscar right there. I can see the angle, but it's just one scene in the first 15 minutes of the movie, and the rest of the movie, outside of the one bar scene, she's very much a vessel for the interviewees to express emotion, to express highlights, where, yes, I get she does have the one scene right off rip, but at the same time, usually your scene comes from, if you're someone who's in the whole movie, comes from one of your later uh, clips, or like or not roles, but clips or scenes in the film, not like your first or your second scene. Uh, a few examples there, I guess, could come back. That would be like Regina King and If Bill Street Could Talk. Her very first scene is her Oscar scene sort of thing and so on and so forth. But um, I don't know. I think it will be very interesting because, like you said, I think this really comes down to the TV awards. Who latches the narrative? Is it Mulligan? Is it Condon? Is it one of the women talking actresses? Or is it someone that we're not really considering at this moment? Because um, there's a lot of people in this film I think that would be worthy of a nomination, and I think Mulligan is one of them. But that, I guess, feeds me into my second question. Moving a little bit away from awards, but from just she said overall, did you think that the rest of the ensemble and the rest of the film as a whole really helped propel the subject matter in a good positive way? Or do you think it was a little bit more mixed and I led uh, everyone to believe last week? I, I loved uh, this. I really, really loved the film. And I we've spoken a lot about it um, in the past on the show that we were worried that the film would end up falling into the trap of being like, well done hollywood good job you did it you fixed the problem and i know last week you said that you didn't felt it did that and i don't feel it did that either i i felt like the film was incredibly respectful and the thing that i think made it very respectful and made it feel like so much more than just hollywood going well done guys we did it we fixed the weinstein problem and there's no more bad people is that the film wasn't focused weinstein was not a, a focus of the film um, he, he was at the center of everything, but the film wasn't about the triumph 
of taking him down. It wasn't about fixing the system. It wasn't about how breaking the Weinstein story changed the world and sparked me too. It isn't about any of that. This is, and this is what makes the film, I think, very respectful and makes it stand out from what it could have been. This is not a film about taking down Weinstein. It's a film about how hard it is for survivors of sexual violence to speak up and speak out. Um, it's really, at its core, a film that interrogates the system that not just keeps people like Weinstein in power, but also makes it nearly impossible for uh, people, women and men, uh, to speak out about things that happen to them for fear of retribution, for fear of legal action, for fear of being called a liar, called uh, um, shamed as though you know you wanted it or whatever. Or even in um, Armand White, one of the worst reviewers out there, he, he did a review of She Said, where he said that the film is bad because it doesn't address the fact that some of these women probably wanted it for career advancement. That's what he said in his review of She Said, which is absolutely disgusting because that's what the film is about. The film is about how the system is built so that if people speak out, people will accuse them of having ulterior motives. And I think that the reason why uh, this film works for me is because it does focus on that so much more than it focuses on the Weinstein case. It's a film about trying to convince people that speaking up is the right thing to do and that it's safe to do, um, rather than being a film about like, oh my God, can we can we get all the people and break the story and take them down? Um, which so many of these films, they, they fall more into that camp. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was incredibly well handled and uh, Maria Schrader, who uh, directed this, I think she is one of the most exciting filmmakers who uh, is up and coming at the moment. You know, is is the direction very flashy here? No, but she has some really great moments of creativity, like all the tracking scenes as Weinstein walks through the building, where every single time his face is blocked, whether it's by someone walking in front of him or seeing him from behind. There's some really, really inspired choices there. She's so incredibly talented, and I can't wait to see what Maria Schrader does next. So looking now more at Oscars for She Said, it doesn't look like Maria Schrader's going to get the love and director no, that no. it sounds like you and I both wish that she could be getting. But what other categories do you see She Said popping up? Because I know last week I mentioned I could see a picture, a screenplay, supporting actress, and maybe a score. Do you feel the same? Do you think less, more? I feel exactly the same. I think it gets the CODA package, but it doesn't win any uh, except Supporting Actress. But who knows? I mean, things can change, but it doesn't feel like the type of film people are going to fall in love with like they did with CODA. But I think it gets picture, screenplay, Supporting Actress. Score, I've got it my number six slot, but I mm -hmm. don't think it fits in right at the moment. Could it fit in eventually? Yeah, but right now... I don't have it in my top five. So I've got the three nominations for this film. But after seeing it, I feel even more confident that this is getting into picture. Definitely. I think it's pretty safe for picture. I think it's actually number two for adapted screenplay. I think it's yeah, above Glass Onion. And I think that Mulligan is pretty safe for nomination. It'd be very weird if she missed. I'm not on the winning train like you are, but I think she's pretty safe in there. And who knows? Nicholas Bertel found his way into score last year of Don't Look Up. So he could repeat it again this year which she said, but you just mentioned this is a film that maybe not a lot of people would fall in love with. But this next movie we're talking about seems like a movie everyone is falling in love with, which opened in theaters this weekend, being The Menu, which is one that I know you and I have both been uh, anticipating, whether it's from the show or just talking outside of it with very different themes and different angle and some stuff. And it seems like a lot of people out there are loving it. But did you love it? I loved it. I loved it. And I, I think you loved it too, right? I did. I had a lot of fun with it. It's one, I don't know how it will work on repeat viewings. I feel like it could go. It's like, I know a lot of people's like, oh, when I rewatch a movie, it's going to go up. Like I mentioned with Decision to Leave. This is when I feel like it could maybe go down a little bit knowing what happens, but I still very much enjoyed it while sitting through it just afterwards. I was like, wait, how did this happen or how did that happen? But that's the fun part about movies like this is it's mm -hmm. supposed to make you want to come back and want to talk with it. I... 
so this is another one right off the bat because I feel like there's a lot of things that can very easily be spoiled in this film. So this is another one where I'm going to give a spoiler warning just because I don't know when spoilers are going to come up in our discussion. Whereas with Decision to Leave, I knew that we could save the spoilers to the end. But I think a lot of th the premise of this film is what you don't want to have spoiled for you. So mm -hmm. let's just say spoilers right now. Move ahead. If you haven't seen the menu yet, do not watch this part of the uh, or watch on YouTube or to listen to on any other platforms. Skip ahead a little bit, please, because this is one that I really do think it's best to go into uh, without knowing anything about it. Uh, so one thing I actually I feel about this is I so I read the script beforehand and there was a lot of changes from the script. And I'll get into some of those changes a little bit later. But um, overall, I was a little bit surprised that I didn't find this to be scary at all. And I, I thought that I might from the script. I heard some people mm -hmm. saying that it was scary at TIFF, but I just found it really funny overall. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't do the, the scares for me. It was more of like a comedy with, with thriller elements than it was a horror movie at all. Did you feel the same way or were you a little spooked by it? No, definitely I feel the same way with you. I had seen people market this as a horror comedy, and I don't see really the horror. I can understand why someone may be, but... It, it's a little bit I, like Saw, I guess. A little bit. Mm, yeah, I guess so. I guess more it would be if people are just very off-put by violence or blood or mm -hmm. something like that, where I guess you could say, well, if someone dies, it has to be a horror, or if you see blood in that case. Like, um, there's other movies I could equate to that but we'll talk about those later maybe but yeah overall i thought it i really liked it ray fines was amazing this is some uh, someone i know that you mentioned before from reading the script like this is a very interesting role just how would they actually attack it and i really liked it i really liked how sinister and how dark it is but like you don't really know where it's going until you find out and you're like okay i'm down with this and then it all culminates at the end with our nice s'more scene which uh is the one dish that doesn't make the most sense to me, but I still I still very much appreciate uh, that dish. And I really like the little title cards for every dish. I was like describing what they were, and then every so often I'd be like, this is awful for like the uh, Nicholas uh, Holt's <laughs> character or at the end uh, with unhappy uh, customers or something like that. And I was like, yes, I like yeah. this. Oh my God, I loved, I, how was, what was the, uh, the way that the, um, uh, the sommelier described the wine um, with hints of um, of wistful regret. I think was what it was. So yeah. good, but yeah, with Ray Fines, the I had said before that I think he's a contender. I took him out of my top ten after seeing the film because he's very subtle in it. He's very creepy. He's extremely compelling to watch. He's in definitely in my personal top five, but yeah, I don't. I don't see this happening at the Oscars at all. Uh, you know, they're in no world do I see this happening at the Oscars. But here's the weirdest thing. Not only did I find him to be a very creepy villain, um, is it weird that Ray Fine's character made me really sad in this? I like, think I really that's felt what they're going him. for. Yeah, really they, they want you to him. sympathize. Like, he's... I, I love that he's never an exaggerated horror villain. I think on the show before, I described his character in the script as a mix between Kathy uh, Bates and Misery and Gordon Ramsay. But he doesn't, he doesn't go for the Gordon Ramsay yelling ever. Uh, and he's, he's not as demented as Kathy Bates. He's just really sad. He's a disappointed artist who is tragically living a life that has turned him into uh, a slave for the rich. And he's, He's making art that doesn't fulfill him, that he knows the people who are consuming it, they, they'll they never truly enjoy it. You know, you've got the mm -hmm. critic there who's just there to pick it apart. Uh, you've got the the rich family that, you know, they don't even remember what they ordered the last time they were here. They don't know what's here. They're just here for the experience. You've got the tech bros who are like, they, they don't care about anything. They're just here for status. You've got the movie star who is just like throwing away the money because he can. And he's another artist like uh, Ray Fine's character who has just sold himself for, for nothing. Um, and then you've got the foodie who, you know, obviously enjoys it. But like, are they really enjoying it or are they just trying to know more than everyone else? 
and mm-hmm. so i don't know i think it's so it's so interesting and it's such a his character is such a interesting showcase of like the folly of art and how hard it can be to make stuff for people that you know are not actually enjoying what you're doing they're just consuming it yeah i definitely agree about fines not for going back to for like awards i could maybe see a world but it would have to have screenplay come along with it and Mm -hmm. they're definitely not going to touch this screenplay uh, especially an original issue of how just beefed up using food analogies uh, that category is and um yeah so ray finds i think is really good i could definitely see some random critics group being like yeah this is our actor of the year nomination but I think what's you know really what interesting to see, see where he gets pushed, if he's going to be a lead or supporting. Because Golden Derby right now has him as supporting. But I could see a world where he could be a lead comedy nomination. But right now, Golden Derby he's... has Nicholas Holt for the lead. I, I don't know why uh, Golden Derby has that. Because if you go on to Searchlight Pictures Awards website, it literally says, uh, lead actor Ray Fine, supporting actor Nicholas Holt. Unquestionable. Who knows? It's, you know, so I think Golden Derby's just behind the curve as always but anyways for uh, you know where i can see this getting nominated it's the globes i i definitely see especially because beforehand i was like okay i don't know how funny the film is going to be i don't know if it's really going to play as a comedy um but it was it was hysterical there were people in my theater were, were laughing the entire time um and i definitely felt pretty demented at times laughing my ass off at some of the things that were going on there but yeah, Globes, that's where I think this maxes out. I think that it can get a few nominations there. Um, I don't think it can make it into comedy picture. I think it's pretty stacked there, especially um, with some of the films that could go comedy, could go drama. But I, I do see, I think Anya Taylor-Joy and I think Ray Fiennes both make it into, um, into lead categories at the, uh, the Globes for comedy. Yeah, I just wanted to double check just to make sure I wasn't giving any incorrect information. Gold Derby still has Holt as lead and um, finds a supporting for uh, for Golden Globes, that is. But l- yeah, just looking at nominations, it could get out the Globes. I do agree. I think the picture category is a little too hard. I think it really comes down to what Banshees and Elvis do. If they both go comedy musical, definitely not a chance. If they go one and one, still probably not. But if they both go drama... I think there is a world where it could get in as the fifth because if they both go drama, that leaves everything everywhere, Babylon, Glass Onion, and two slots. But could go to Bros, could go to Ticket to Paradise, could go nope. to something else. It could go to Nope. Nope. It could go to Nope. Uh, Matilda, or if you want to be a little bit Matilda. more with the new rules of eligibility, it could go to Bardo, it could go to RRR, it could go to Triangle of Sadness, it could go to Pinocchio. Those are all ones that are technically listed in the musical comedy category. Do I think any of those really have a shot? I still don't think the Globes are really considering international or animated movies, even if they say they are. Oh, but that's dude, something that we'll if, see coming down. If the Globes nominate Pinocchio, I'm going to literally combust. Like, I'm, I, my guts will be all over the walls. It's going to be disgusting um, because, like, it's ha- if the Globes put an animated movie in one of their picture categories it's real it's real i really i forgot to mention before i really love hong chow in this i think she may actually be my best in show maybe like 1a 1b with ray fines i don't know something about her character's dynamic and just how she was just so like direct and so like on focus and not phase at all the whole time making sure everything keeps getting back into place and keeps going according to plan but then at the end you can clearly see how much they care for whether it's a chef or just this business and they can't have anything going off of plants so they take matters into their own hands does it end up working for them no but it shows that they actually are committed to this like a lot of the other people in the kitchen are where they clearly are showing maybe i'm not okay with what's going on but i'm still going to do it because of my fascination or my devotion to whether it's this kitchen or just the chef himself i i just love this film i thought that it was incredibly funny. The ensemble was great. Uh, from Nicholas Holt, who was so funny, to Ray Fiennes, to Anya Taylor-Joy, to Hong Chow. It's, it's a crazy time when Anya Taylor-Joy might be the weakest link in the film. Yes. The ensemble's so good. I just wish we got more of every character. Because, like, you learn, like, what you mentioned before, whether it's the tech bros or the f- struggling actor and 
his um, assistant who's taking money or the uh, married couple who where the husbands have the infidelity and bringing other women to this restaurant or the uh, journalists and critics where one's like a yes man, a uh, no man sort of thing with the head critic and then um, Nicholas Holt himself with hiring an escort just because he had to have someone to come. He didn't care who it was. He just had to be there. And then I really like the dynamic with uh, the chef's mother where she's just so over it and ready to just drink herself to pass out. It's a really fun film and I'm really glad that it seems like it's found its audience. Like the theater that I was in was almost full. Uh, which was great. It was a Thursday night, almost full. A lot of old people, though, uh, which I don't know if they all knew what they were getting into, because I did, when I was in line at TIFF, one of the uh, old women that told me that she loved Empire of Light, she said she really wanted to see the menu because she loves Chef's Table, and she loves seeing uh, movies where good food is made, and she thought the menu looked very wholesome. And I had to tell her, no, no, no. no. Mm Mm-mm. It is, uh, it's a horror movie. <laughs> Don't watch it. Um, and so I, I was wondering when I saw the demographic at my theater being a lot of old people, I was like, okay, I wonder how many of them thought that this was going to be something very different from what it is. Mm-hmm. Well, on that same note, something very different than what we thought it would be or from what we wanted it to be is us circling a full round to our initial discussion of the Grammys. Because, as we mentioned before, there's a lot of people we wanted to see nominated, not get nominated. But looking past snubs, looking past people that didn't get nominated, let's look at what the actual nominees were. And that brings us to our big category of Record of the Year, which the Grammys seem to every year make their big category, their best picture, the last one they award. And this one, I think, I think is a one that we should clarify for people out there, because not everyone may know the difference between song and Record of the Year. Song of the Year is more for the songwriting, for like the actual lyrics, the composition of everything. Production is more for how everything comes together, the instrumentation, the vocals, everything. So Record of the Year is more about the complete song, while song is more about the writing, which to me is still a little bit confusing uh, why I want to be called like this or that of the year or something. But I guess you got to keep the theme of very simplistic, but song and record. Yeah, um... I feel like the Grammy voters don't know the difference either. <laughs> I, it's just like best sound editing and mixing where like if you really into it, I'm sure you could probably tell the difference. But yeah. the, the, the general person isn't going to know because I didn't know until I had to Google it and be like, okay, which one is which again? Because originally I thought record of the year was for the songwriting. So I was like, okay, well, my favorite here is this song. And I was like, oh, the other one's songwriting. That makes more sense looking at the nominees. But – does it make sense? Because the songwriting, we'll get into the song of the year nominees, but I think that the song of the year nominees are like pretty atrocious if you think of it as a songwriting award. Uh, mm-hmm. But for record of the year, we've got uh, these are the ten songs nominated for be- uh, for record of the year. We've got "Don't Shut Me Down" by ABBA, "Easy on Me" by Adele, "Break My Soul" by Beyonce, "Good Morning Gorgeous" by Mary J. Blige, uh, "You and Me on the Rock" by Brandi Carlile, "Woman" by Doja Cat. Bad Habit by Steve Lacey, The Heart Part 5 by Kendrick Lamar, About Damn Time by Lizzo, and As It Was by Harry Styles. So Quite the lineup. <laughs> it, is it quite the lineup? I don't know. I'm, no. I'm torn. So the first thing I want to say is there's a few songs here that I'm like, I just don't think that these fit into here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ABBA song, I, I hadn't listened to the ABBA album beforehand. I listened to it, and I was like, okay, this just... You can tell that ABBA hasn't made music for like 40 years. It feels like it. Uh, it really, it, there's no passion, nothing. This song I thought was incredibly boring. It was a far cry from what ABBA once was. The Mary J. Blige song I just found to be really boring. Uh, the Doja Cat song, I like a lot of Doja Cat stuff. Kiss Me More, one of my favorite tracks. I don't like this song. And also, how is this eligible? This song came out with her album Planet Her, which was released in June 2021. This song has been out for a year and a half. My understanding is it was released as a single, and that's how it became eligible. I agree. Shouldn't it, it should be when the first song first comes out, just like how singles are eligible the, before their album comes out. Like last year was Soak Sonic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Leave the Door Open was released as a single, and then the album came out after the eligibility. So the album wasn't eligible, but the song was. I feel like the song should be eligible from when they first hit their platform, whether it's streaming or physical and 
the defense I saw on social media was that Doja and her label put out as a single in like September, which is after the Grammy eligibility starts for the next year, and that's how it's eligible. But still, that doesn't like it doesn't make sense in my head. But as we mentioned before, the Grammys are a mess. They don't really follow any sort of rules because I fully agree that ABBA record is very mid. But the Grammys have a history of rewarding people with legacy awards. And sometimes I think this, I don't think ABBA will win. I mean, they could, but Grammys are that crazy. But I think the nomination is like, hey, we didn't nominate you before. So how about you can still say you're a a Grammy nominee or uh, they've been nominated before. Here's an extra one to be like, hey, we still like you. Just like, you know, we forgot about you this time. I don't know. If you're looking at production of the year, while I do really like that Doja Cat song, um, I wouldn't pick it personally. If you're looking at production, I think As It Was or Break My Soul has the best production of the year. Yes, uh, yes. Break My Soul is my, the song I like more, but As It Was is so catchy. The production elements are so good. Uh, Harry's vocals on the song work really good as well. But if you're looking overall full concept of, I don't know, a record, uh, the, be- the Break My Soul is just like a perfect track. And I know that's kind of lame to say, but like, I don't know. That's my favorite song from the new Beyonce mm-hmm. album. It, I feel like it sums up the album as a whole very well. And it just has, especially if you listen to it in the context of the album too, It its production elements are lifted because it transitions from the song before and it transitions perfectly into the song after, which you're looking at production elements. Like that's a really cool and interesting idea of how you can make it sound like this is just one long song. But like I mentioned before, as it was very well produced and made song yeah. and Bad Habits, I think a sleeper choice here if they really want to go with the like a poppy populist choice. But I don't know. I feel like this is Beyonce's to lose. But we said that before, and Beyonce still loses. Yeah, I mean, I I'm between the same two as you. I think that the winner should be either Break My Soul or As It Was, and it will be one of those. Some other ones here that I just I don't want people to sleep on. Um, I also really love the Heart Part Five. Kendrick is one of my favorites. I think it's very interesting that they submitted the Heart Part Five and not one of his Mr. Morale songs. Although the Heart Part Five really is one of the best songs that he put out this year. One song that I was sleeping on before, which uh, hit me when I, because I'd never heard it before, but I, I've kind of had like a bit of a negative feeling towards Brandy Carlisle beforehand. But I do really like You and Me on the Rock, and that guitar riff at the beginning, the do-do-do-do-do-do-do, so stuck in my head. It's so good. It's so catchy. Um, So honestly, for me, that top five, uh, from As It Was, Break My Soul, Heart Part Five, Easy On Me, You and Me on the Rock, I feel like that's a strong top five for me. What I think is really interesting there, we're going to jump over Album of the Year and come back to that in a second, go into Song of the Year. The two songs that you highlighted most there, I think are better writing composition songs and produce songs especially the heart part five which i think just especially if you pair it with the video to uh the writing there really emphasizes what themes and messages kendrick's really trying to progress after listening to it a few more times since these nominations come out i was like yeah that's his best written song of the year and that's his maybe not the best produced song but its production's still pretty good and <laughs> that's when i think has a better shot to win in song of the year than it does in record do I think it's going to win in either? No, just because the competition's a lot more suited to the Grammys' liking. Uh, for Song of the Year, I think there's an obvious winner here. It's going to be Taylor Swift for All Too Well, just with how big that song was when it came out. What this song essentially is, it's essentially a long diary version, which is writing and composition, because it's taking a normal like three, four-minute track and extending it out to ten while telling a story. But I think when I mentioned before about the song and records of the year having them mix up originally a song like uh bonnie rats uh just like that is i think a really good written song oh my god it's just, so good <laughs> but like as like a produced song it's lacking but i think that's to the point yeah. to be so minimalist to emphasize the vocals so i feel like if the grammys are going to be like inspired and pick a like unconventional pick that could be the sleeper here but if they're gonna go with something obvious all Too Well is the clear choice because, I mean, as it was in Break My Soul, there's great tracks. They're not the best written tracks. Um, Easy One Me is another one I feel like, yeah, they could go, but that's so basic. If they're going to go basic, they're going to go Taylor Swift. But if they're going to go inspired, it could be The Heart and give Kendrick a finally a big award or Bonnie Rat just because of how well written that is. But we have to mention it because it's here. We got DJ Khaled with God Did in here, which I understand why the song's nominated. It's nominated for that Do Jay-Z you? verse. Why? It's nominated for that Jay-Z verse. He goes, he has f- four or five minutes where he's straight rapping, and it's really good. Just the rest of the song's awful. 
Little like, Wayne's like mumbling his way through. Rick Ross is Rick Ross, and then John Legend and Friday have about twenty seconds for the outro. The song is not good, but Jay Z is really good on it, and I think that's why it's here because it's not in record of the year, but it's in song of the year, and it's but there, the love so for Jay Z. Many, there's so many better rap songs that they could have, if they wanted to, award verse writing there's so many better things that they could have done so just just for reference as well here's the song of the year lineup this year a b c d e f u by gail uh the tiktok song about damn time by lizzo all too well the 10 minute version by taylor swift as it was by harry styles bad habit by steve lacy break my soul by beyonce which is I'm going to say a little bit of a questionable um, nomination in this category because uh, much better produced song than a written song. Mm -hmm. Easy On Me by Adele, God Did by DJ Khaled, uh, The Heart Part 5 by Kendrick Lamar, and Just Like That by Bonnie Raitt. Um, And yeah, this is, it's somehow much worse than the record lineup because like, it's an award for songwriting how are you going to do an award for songwriting and uh, nominate the A, B, C, D, E, F, U, and your mom and your sister? Like, what? Like, exactly. How, how are you going to, it doesn't, it, it makes no sense to me. It makes no sense. That and God did are just like how, and there's so many on the Beyonce record. There's so many songs that are very well written Break My Soul, it, it feels like if you were to nominate Work by Rihanna, where, like, that is a great track, but is it a great song? I don't know about that, uh, because Break My Soul, yeah, great club mix, great club beat, great uh, vibe to it, but, like, for the most part, that is, you won't break my soul, you won't break my soul. Like, it's just, it, it, that's that's what it is. That's what it is. Um, I don't know. I, I Like, there's some good nominees here. Like, I think Just Like That by Bonnie Raitt is an incredibly inspired nominee. That's a song that I had not heard before this. And going and listening to it, I, you know, I was not expecting to, to really love the track. I think I've heard some old Bonnie Raitt stuff, but, like, Oh my God! It's this is a that, it's a great track, and I could see it actually pulling a win here. Although I, I think, like you said, Taylor Swift is just gonna run away with this. Although, like, here's another one where it's like how, you're gonna tell me that a song that's from 2012 with a couple of added verses is eligible for a songwriting prize? You are you kidding me? Like what? What the hell is the eligibility at the Grammys? I think there is no eligibility, and that's what the eligibility is. I would say for the one defense for God did at least they didn't nominate First Class for that extra rap song for songwriting of the year. So it could have been worse. It could have been worse. <laughs> oh my God. Oh yeah. No, I actually I'm going to say I prefer Jack Harlow to anything DJ Khaled has done. Easy. See, I. For the most part, I agree with you, but like I mentioned before, I'm pretty sure this nomination for God did solely for the Jay-Z verse, which is a really good verse, but I don't think it should have been here. Can I name something off the top of my head if they were going to pull from the rap category, looking at the other rap category nominees that should be here instead? Not really, because you have like Push and P, you have uh, Churchill Downs and uh, First Class from Harlow. Maybe you could pull something from um, the Push album, but still yeah. Push the T's not to the level of getting a song in for Songwriter of the Year, and... Uh, personally, I would have liked to see Vegas here, but still, Vegas isn't really the best written song either. So, uh, looking at the other rap nominees that they did yeah. nominate, not pulling off from anything else that's out there, because there's, like Matt mentioned, there's so many great rap stuff that did not get even a mention, whether it's the Denzel Curry, the Jet album, regardless, there's still a lot more. But looking at the ones they did nominate, God, it's not the worst option. That Jay Z's verse is really good, just like I mentioned. The Lil Wayne verse is awful. The Rick Ross verse is not good. And John Legend and Friday have about. A 30 second outro that's just repeating like three words the whole time and dj Khaled every so often say god did so um it's not gonna win but it's here and i think that's one of the downsides of the grammys expanding their lineup instead of being five nominees to ten you're gonna get stuff like that where it shouldn't be here but yeah they gotta fill the lineup and they're gonna pull from the popular stuff because if we move over from album of the year both these categories for song and record have nominees that pretty much fill up the 
song and record uh, nominations out of this album of the year lab and those nominees include voyage by abba 30 by adele um i'm gonna butcher the name here the and bad Verano bunny City. album and then we have renaissance from beyonce good morning gorgeous deluxe version from mary j blige and these silent days by brandy carlisle music of the spears by coldplay mr morale and the big steppers by kendrick lamar special by lizzo and harry's house by harry styles the reason why i emphasize deluxe from mary j blige because if we go back a few years ago um Black Pumas got nominated two straight years for the same album just because one was deluxe and one wasn't. So that's why I want to emphasize deluxe because uh, I know we are a little bit different for Black Pumas. I don't think they make good albums. I think they have inter- I think they have some good songs. But the albums as a whole I don't think are the greatest. But I still think that's hilarious that they got nominated for uh, self-titled and like the rock category. But then the next year they got nominated for the deluxe version, an album of the year when there's like five extra tracks. So here's here's my thing with so with Black Pumas. This is a little off topic, but I actually do think that the the Grammy nominating committee was bribed for Black Pumas. It's not because Probably. it's a bad. I it's not because it's a bad record. It's because it came out of nowhere. It had no critical mm-hmm. acclaim. There, like, it was not an album that was chart topping. Uh, it's not an album that was like being named as one of the best of the year. Like sometimes you get those those albums that come out of nowhere for the Grammys. Like um, I I will never forget in 2010, uh, all the people going like, "Who the fuck is Arcade Fire?" But like that was a record. The Suburbs by Arcade Fire had so much acclaim. No one had heard of Black Pumas before it just showed up in the in the album of the year lineup at the Grammys. So like, mm-hmm. uh, that's I guess the way that. I, I think it's like the tourist at the Golden Globes in 2010, where it was like I I think that the record label bribed them. I I think the same thing is happening with her, because there's no yes. reason why her should have so many more Grammys and Grammy nominations than her contemporaries who are, you know, how does her have more Grammy nominations than SZA? Well, you stole the words right out of my mouth, because. I was about to say, like, this is the first year we don't have her in any of the big four categories since she broke into the scene. But, I mean, you just mentioned it right there. Yeah. I think the Grammys are like the Globes in the sense where they do nominate the populist choices, but also are easily persuaded based off of which labels or for the Globes perspective, which studios. Give them the extra nudge and be like, hey, this one. But mm-hmm. looking here just at album of the year, I think this is probably the easiest category of the three. Um, they've told Beyonce no two straight times when she's facing Adele, and I don't think they're going to let that happen again, especially with the revisionist rules that are going to place to help stuff like that from not happening. I think there is a small chance where Harry Styles could play spoiler, but still, I feel like mm. Beyonce's time is before Harry's, but Harry did have a very big moment this year. I would say, Beyonce, yes, Beyonce is winning, but I would say over Harry Styles, it's Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar has been in a similar boat to Beyonce where he lost for Good Kid Mad City. He lost for To Pimp a Butterfly. He lost for Damn. Could he win for this one? He's going to win Album of the Year eventually. But Mm -hmm. um, will it be for this? I don't think so. I think it's Beyonce's time. And on the visual side of the Grammys, because this is a movie podcast, we got to talk about soundtrack awards. So let's start off with the best compilation soundtrack for visual media. And the nominees here, um, it's a mix of TV, film, and last year. Uh, so we got Elvis, we got Encanto, we got Stranger Things Season 4, um, Volume 2 of that. Then we got Top Gun Maverick and West Side Story. So the two that we're looking at here really are Elvis and Top Gun Maverick because those impact the Oscar race. And I think it's interesting because it shows that, yeah, awards voters are looking at Elvis. Maybe that's a good thing uh, for you, my dude. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, personally, Elvis would not be my pick out of this this bunch. I think this goes to the music video thing. They did a really good job of picking a bunch of different things. You have Encanto fitting that like Disney musical type side. You have West Side Story, an actual musical. You have Maverick, which has songs and has a score. You have Stranger Things vi- uh, Season 4, Volume 2. I think Volume 1 had the better music, but I also don't really remember any songs from Volume 2. And then you have Elvis. And honestly, I don't know what they will pick here. Because at first glance, you're like, obviously it's an Encanto. But Encanto is severely underperformed across all categories. Like, we don't talk about Bruno showed up nowhere. Uh, Encanto did not show up in Album of the Year. Um, it didn't pop up anywhere. Where Elvis did, because uh, 
Vegas by Doja Cat popped up in the rap category, and then Top Gun Maverick has Lady Gaga attached to it, and West Side Story is an actual musical. So I think there's some very interesting choices here. I think if I had to make a prediction, I think they may go with Elvis because it's the most artist and it's a very different scene, but I could see a sleeper of Encanto actually, like, this is the one category where it actually does perform in. Yeah, I, I don't think Encanto is winning here. I think it's going to be Stranger Things. I'm trying to find the um, the album that has the volume two because, I, I, I don't know, I think that having Kate Bush on this, I think that having Talking Heads, all of that, I think that's going to net it for it. So I'm just scrolling through my phone to be like, okay, what's, where is the, um, yeah, well, where's the... That's the thing because both those songs you just listed were in volume, would have been in the first half of the season. I know, but that's the thing that I, I can't find is I just, when I look up the album, I just find a full album and mm-hmm. not volume one, volume two. Um, but they'd be in both sides, and the Metallica song is in volume two for sure. True, true. Um, but I don't, so I'm going to say Stranger Things takes this, but um, personally, I'd pick West Side Story. Personally, Tick, Tick, Boom should be here. I agree. And if Tick, Tick, Boom was here, that would be my pick as well. But from what's here, my personal pick, West Side Story, mm-hmm. I hot take. I don't know this is a hot take. I like the music in the new one better than the original movie. Um, yeah, same. But uh, that would be my personal pick. I don't really like the songs in Maverick, per se, and Elvis kind of the same way, too. Like I like some songs, but I also think some songs are really bad. And Kanto... I think it's fine. I'm not the biggest Encanto fan and Stranger Things. It has it has cool songs, but none of them are new. They're all old, and I don't feel like it's kind of fair to throw old versus new. Like, yeah, you could say that about West Side Story, but at least they're re-recording the songs compared to Stranger Things, where it's just plopping songs from the past and using them now. Oh, but that works. That works. They've given like "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou" best like album of the year before, and that was literally (laughs) like like some new bluegrass songs and then a bunch of old stuff um i i don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that they just go i like this compilation they chose good songs plus an award for the fact that the music supervisor of that literally turned kate bush's song into a hit 35 years after it first released which is so cool uh because kate bush rules but yeah um our next category we've got best score for visual media Um, And this one has film and TV again. And we've only got one nominee that's uh, eligible this year, but this might be a sign that this person could get in uh, this year. Because we've got The Batman, Michael Giacchino. Uh, We've got Encanto by Jermaine Franco. We've got No Time to Die, soundtrack by Hans Zimmer. Power of the Dog, my personal pick of this category, Johnny Greenwood. Gorgeous album. God damn, is that album good. And then we've got Succession, uh, season three by Nicholas Brattel. So yeah, I just said mine, but I'm gonna be honest. I think that the winner here is going to be Succession. Um, it could also be Encanto, but um, where do you stand on this? You know, what's really interesting to me is the whole Grammy eligibility season, because you see that Hans Zimmer's here for No Time to Die, uh, not for Dune, because Dune was eligible last year, even though the movie came out after um, the eligibility season ended. And they got nominated for Best Score last year. Uh, but look at the nominees this year. Uh, Batman's my favorite of the bunch here. As I mentioned before, I'm not the biggest fan of Encanto. Uh, part of that does lie to the music. I think it's fine, but I don't think it's as amazing as a lot of people say. I like the score for No Time to Die. Is it Hans Zimmer's best work? No. Uh, Power of the Dog has a really fun score, but it's not also like the most like overall and then Nicholas Bertello's scores are great. Have I seen Succession? No, so I haven't heard the music in relation to the show. But on its own, it works very well. So using in terms of the movie itself, I'm picking Batman. In terms of what I would listen to on my own time, I'm picking Batman. If I had to do like a personal albums of the year, the Batman score would make my albums of the year because hmm. it's still an album. It's just meant from a movie. And if Encanto soundtrack could make album of the year, or Oh Brother, We're Out There could win album of the year, why couldn't it have scored? be in there so that would be my pick and what i think will win too because um while you could make the case for succession's the only tv nominee i feel like the batman has the popularity maybe Encanto can overtake it but i don't know i feel like since it's the most recent of the bunch it has a little bit of a leg up interesting yeah you, i mean you make a good point there uh we got our next category and our last grammy category we're going to be talking about which is the best song written for visual media 
Uh, and all of these are for films, and a lot of them are actually eligible this year. So we got uh, Be Alive from King Richard, which is not eligible, was nominated last year. We've got We Don't Talk About Bruno from Encanto, which was not eligible last year and uh, I mean, was eligible last year, but was not submitted, so it did not get nominated last year, but probably would have won last year if it did get submitted. Mm. Um, I, I think it would have won. I think it would have beat Billie Eilish. I do. I do think it would have. Uh, do I agree with that? No, but I think it would have won. And actually, you know what? Talking about We Don't Talk About Bruno, that's one where I am actually surprised that didn't make it into um, the Record of the Year or Song of the Year lineup. You know, some of those Song of the Year lineups, Take Out God Did, put in We Don't Talk About Bruno. It's got more compelling rap sequences in that. Than... I agree. I agree. <laughs> um, but anyways, we've got our uh, next few nominees, which are all eligible for this year's Oscars. And could this be a little preview for the Oscar race? Possibly. So we got Carolina from Where the Crawdads Sing by Taylor Swift. We have Hold My Hand by Lady Gaga from Top Gun Maverick. We got Keep Rising from The Woman King by Jesse Wilson. And we got Nobody Like You from Turning Red by Billie Eilish. Uh, so will all of those, film, uh, those songs get nominated for Best Song? I don't think so, I'm going to be honest. And I think that some of the bigger nominees here are going to be eligible next year, which is going to be, uh, obviously, the Black Panther song uh, by Rihanna, uh, Lift Me Up, is not here because it's not eligible. So of this lineup, I think it's obvious that we don't talk about Bruno wins this. But what do you think? Yeah, I think the there's a small chance that Beyonce love carries over here as well, and she walks away. Beyonce could clean sweep and win every category because, as we mentioned before, she's competing in categories she's not usually in, like dance, where, as we've said, people can vote in whatever categories they want, and they just see Beyonce and they name check. Could that carry over here? Possibly, because we did see we don't talk about Bruno underperform, not show up in song, not show up in record of the year. So mm -hmm. we've seen Encanto be restricted solely to the movie things, and if it's not winning album or score then yeah it could win this i i that would be my personal pick i really like this song um to your point for like the oscar thing i makes no sense why they didn't submit it you could have submitted both songs you didn't have to submit just one you could have submitted both to the oscars last year and i, I think it would made it for a really interesting race because bond songs recently haven't lost at least daniel craig bond songs and billy eilish with, she's kind of like her billy eilish shows up she usually kind of wins and um I think it would have made it for a really fun race for song last year because I love when races are competitive, whether it's something as small as song or something as big as picture, and that carries over here for the uh, Grammys as well. I think that it's Bruno versus Be Alive. Carolina is a whatever song. I think it could show up for an Oscar nomination this year, but... Uh, I, I don't think it will, honestly. I, I, I don't think Taylor Swift makes the Oscar nomination. I, I don't have her in right now, but she's my six. I could see if something underperforms or if they just like, we don't care about Diane Warren anymore. Let's go it off. But they won't do that. Um, and then the Lady Gaga song, this isn't her best song. Keep Rising is a fine song. And Nobody Like You wasn't even the best song from Turning Red. And I think a lot of people like have that opinion. So I don't know. Be Alive. We don't talk about Bruno, but the edge probably goes to Bruno because Encanto is not, not going to win an award. Yeah. It's it's Bruno. Bruno wins here. Um, I don't I don't see be alive as a possibility for a win here. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's the Grammys. So now we're gonna head back to the Oscars and we're gonna wrap things up this week with our predictions of the week. So Dylan, do you want to take it away? And that brings us to my predictions for best sound, uh, which is a category where we saw some Babylon fluctuation because Babylon's a sound contender that a lot of us had thought okay this is pretty solid maybe not for a win but for a nomination and with it falling down the rankings of best picture and a lot of other categories this is a spot i could see it fall off and so right now it fell from my number four down to my number six i'll list off the rest of the stuff i have missing before i get into what i have as my top five into my lap this week is emancipation with um clayton davis seen it giving it such high praise i'm like well it can't be unwarranted. There has to be some positives here. And with it being a Civil War movie, there's going to be some fight scenes. So I throw it in here. Do I know if it's a real contender? Not really. But this time of the year, we know what it is and what isn't a contender. So it doesn't hurt to put in something that is sight unseen into your 10 
uh, because there's a chance emancipation could blow up. It's Apple. We saw last year. Apple knows how to contend once people actually like attach themselves to something. They know how to promote it. And then that brings us up to everything everywhere at nine. Woman King at eight. Nope at seven. Some blockbusters or bigger name movies that could have a route, but I just don't really see it. Babylon, as I mentioned, drops number six. That makes my number five now All Quiet on the Western Front. Even though that it is a film that is fading in some of its nominations, I feel like this is one where it is a little bit stronger with it being a war movie. We've seen in the past other war movies don't need big love to show up here. Uh, Greyhound. Well, Hex. Um, one more time. Greyhound. Greyhound, yes. Sorry. I was like, I talked at the same time. I was like, I couldn't hear what it is. But yes, Greyhound in the COVID year. Uh, and we had some of those Mark Wahlberg movies that weren't war, oh, yeah. but like action show up here, like Lone Survivor and some other ones. So this is definitely oh my a God. category. The Michael Bay one, 13 Hours, Secret, uh, yes. the Secret Heroes of Benghazi, Benghazi or whatever. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a category where like you don't need overt love to show up. And if you're technically good, you can get in. All Call on the Western Front, technically good. Um, this one may be a little bit more hope predicting, but most people who have seen the Batman really give it good pauses for its sound. Superhero movies have shown up in this category before. I think if Babylon is a dropping contender, Batman could swoop in for its spot. But realistically, Batman, Babylon, nope, probably all fighting for one of those last spots in best sound. And that brings us to our top three. I think it's a pretty unanimous top three at this moment, but there could be some detractors. Elvis at three, you have music scenes, you have big scenes, and it's a Baz Luhrmann movie, which doesn't always guarantee a sound nomination, but it guarantees that there are going to be eyes on the film, and especially in its tech categories. Then you have our one, our top number one, and its only real competitor being Top Gun Maverick at number one, and Avatar The Way of Water at two. Maverick's, I would say, probably like 95% winning this category, but there's still a small chance where because we are just in November, that it could change and Avatar could come in, but at the moment I have Maverick 1, Avatar 2. Okay, I, I have the same top two as you. I don't have Elvis in my five for for a film that is getting um, acclaim for a performance in a music biopic. You don't need sound to come along with it. So personally, I don't have Elvis in. Um, I think that Everything Everywhere might not be top five, but it should be a little bit higher because here's the thing. If we can accept that Top Gun and Everything Everywhere all at once are the top two for editing, then Everything Everywhere all at once should be in consideration for sound because those two go together. And if it wins editing, it I feel like it would need a sound nomination at the very least. Um, but I don't know if that's going to happen. The other thing I'm going to say is look at last year's lineup. Um, not all of the films in the sound lineup last year were loud. What was there? power of the dog the sound category sometimes they just put in films that they really like that have some interesting sound choices and so my contender for that that i want to put forward is the fablements um and the reason being for that is that the fablements has a lot of very interesting sound choices uh the way it uses the projector sound is very interesting throughout uh, and there's some really nice sound work in um just the projector sound is, is just lovely and the way that it sounds as it goes over the splices they do a great job of um of doing foley for that and mixing it together and um yeah i, I think that the fablemans has enough in it to get in the way that the power of the dog did last year because the entire selling point for the power of the dog getting a sound nomination last year was the comb basically the comb was uh was the selling point and yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think the Fablemans could totally make it in here because they don't just go for, for the loud movies. They go for the movies that make unique choices. So why don't you tell us what your updated best director lineup is? Because you have seen some extra movies and seen some movies a second time. Absolutely. So um, my best director lineup changed a lot this week. It changed around quite a bit. Uh, so I'm going to go from the top down. And I'm going to start off with the undeniable winner. Uh, congratulations, Mr. Spielberg, now that Chazelle is uh, not win competitive. I feel like Steven Spielberg's just going to sweep the season Jane Campion style. He's going to walk away with the win here. I feel like it's just undeniable at this point. Spielberg, he's winning this. It's uh, it's his career third Oscar, and I think it's it's worthy. It's worthy, and you know it's a very personal story. He's got a great narrative. And yeah, 
I think it's he's running away with it. It's one and then a goddamn country mile until second place. And in second and third place, I kind of have these two tied. Uh, so pick and choose who you want in second and third place. Daniels, Sarah Polly. Um, a lot of people say that Daniels can miss director. I think that's ridiculous because if we're really saying that this is one of the biggest contenders of the year and it's an incredibly directing heavy movie, how the hell are the Daniels going to miss for it? Likewise with Sarah Polly, I don't think the Academy, yes, I know the Academy is not a hive mind and they don't make decisions this way, but I don't see any year in the near future missing a woman in best director. Not to mention that Sarah Polly is incredibly deserving of this honor, um, of this nomination, maybe even being deserving of a win, possibly. she Her direction here is, is so strong, it really makes the film. Um, she's doing a lot of stuff, very interestingly, cinematically. She's going to get nominated across the board. BAFTA, Golden Globe, DGA, Critics' Choice, she gets in here, no question. As for Daniels, they get DGA, they get Golden Globe, they get Critics' Choice, they might miss BAFTA, but it does not matter. They're in, they're here, they will not win, but they are here. Then at number four, I bumped up Martin McDonough this week into my top five to, uh, to replace a certain Mr. Chazelle. But yeah, I've got Martin McDonough here. I think that he is... Um, He's very strong for this film. He missed for three billboards, yes, but uh, this film is much more poetically composed than that was. You know, three billboards was much more of a screenplay movie, and I think Banshees is much more of a director movie. So I can definitely see Martin McDonough getting in here, as well as, like, it being a little bit of an apology for, hey, sorry you missed last time, even though you were a top two contender to win Best Picture. Uh, then number five and six... These two are also tied for me. I don't know who to put in. Right now, the flavor of the week, I've got uh, number five, Park Chan-wook, for a decision to leave. Reason being, Park Chan-wook, he's going to get in BAFTA. He won the Can Best Director Prize. He's going to have a lot of goodwill from members of the director's branch. Um, but really, he just makes BAFTA here. I don't think he, he can really make anything else, but he definitely makes BAFTA. So my number six, which I'm leaning towards more now, is a top five. It just seems too obvious. It seems too obvious, and I hate doing the obvious five um, this early. But, you know, let's screw it. Let's say number five is going to be Todd Field, and number six is Park Chan-wook. Um, I think one of those two is making it, but, you know, which one? I think that the, uh, the European branch of the Academy will throw themselves behind one of these two for a directing nomination. Um, and you know what? Screw it. Todd Field is number five. Uh, it's the obvious one here. Todd Field is number five. Then at number seven, Damien Chazelle. The film has dropped a lot with, uh, with the fact that it is mixed reception. So, yeah, uh, will this have the unanimous support needed to get in? No, it's the same way that, like, last year Guillermo del Toro loved, but he didn't make it in. Uh, or the same way that Adam McKay did not make it in. Then number eight. You're not going to like this. I'm sorry. Number eight is James Cameron. Um, I don't know, man. If if Denis Villeneuve couldn't get it, it is James Cameron. I don't know. But if Jam if uh, Avatar becomes a top five contender, yeah, he'll, he'll probably be in. But I, until it's a top five contender, I don't have him here. Then number nine, I've got Alejandro Gonzalez and Yaritu. Uh, I did see Bardo today. Um, it is a very director-heavy movie. Directors are going to love it. They already do love it. You know, is this, um, is it a strong contender here? Mm, not really, but it's possible. It's possible that directors just absolutely love the shit out of this movie and, and nominate it. And then number 10, I've got uh, Joseph Kaczynski for uh, Top Gun Maverick, which is not happening. Thank the Lord. He does not deserve a directing nomination for this one, as fun as the film is. Um, but... It's a possibility. He could very easily get into DGA. He could very easily get into the Golden Globe. He will not make it into Critics' Choice or BAFTA for directing, but I would not put it past the DGA or the Golden Globes to nominate Joseph Kaczynski. So he's top 10. Uh, and then right on the periphery, I've got Guillermo del Toro for Pinocchio and Ruben Ostlin for Triangle of Sadness, but I do not see either of those guys happening, um, which is why they're out of my top 10. But yeah, what... What are your general thoughts on uh, on the five, on the ten? 
Um, I mean, you make great cases for everything you have there. I do think there is a world where Daniels isn't a top director candidate and the film can still perform well. I mean, we've seen in years past with Coda Lasher not even getting in for director or, um, I mean, it doesn't help the year before, Chloe Zhao sweeping the season for uh, director for Land. But we've seen in the past where you don't necessarily have to be a one or a two for your film still to win picture. But I still think they, especially if, if Chazelle is missing, I think that really helps the Daniels case to get in. Um, I think director, as I mentioned before, there's two, three kind of guarantee. I think there's two guaranteed names in there. And it's Spielberg and it's Polly. And I think that Cameron is someone who, if he's in there, he's competitive. But if he's not in, or he can miss. I don't really feel like he's a five or he's a four for director. I feel like he's one or two. If this movie hits a lot, he could be one. More likely, he's probably two. Or he's like seven or eight. Mm -hmm. I feel like if this movie catches on to the Academy, he's getting a director nomination. There's no way this film's getting nominated for cinematography, getting nominated for editing, getting nominated for sound. Yes, you can mention Villeneuve last year. But James Cameron's not Denis Villeneuve. James Cameron's a previous director, winner, a two-time nominee. James Cameron doesn't do what James Cameron doesn't do. Um, exactly. Okay. I'm going to give a case on, on James Cameron as well. So you've said before that like this is his triumphant return. Could they award him because it's his triumphant return? Um, but did you see the news recently where he said that if the Avatar sequels are not um, as big a financial success as he hopes, he's prepared to wrap it up with the third film? Mm -hmm. so um i think that there's a world where your your avatar sweep happens for the third film because that's true. if it's like if it's like uh, a case where they think that cameron is wrapping it up then yeah he can win director i actually would say he, he's a likely winner for director even if not for picture i could see him winning for director for his passion project that's taken all these years but maybe not for the way of water maybe for the next one that's, that's a solid point. Um, I think it just really comes down to how this movie hits. If this movie hits where it's a picture, where we've mentioned in the past it has a shot for adapted with how interesting adapted is this year. If it's going to win cinematography, if it's going to be a top editing, a like top sound, a top this contender, I feel there's definitely a case. With everyone saying it's Spielberg and there's no competition, well, I don't think Cameron's probably going to win at the end of the day. I still think you can't sight unseen someone not being a contender. Like, yes, that worked for Chazelle and Babylon where he wasn't a real contender, but I still think there's a there's a universe out there, you could say, where Cameron can still win director. Is it a likely one? Probably not, but I still think it's not Spielberg 100% or Spielberg 95%. I would say it's like 90, uh, pretty solid. But yeah, other than that, I think your director looks solid with Chazelle dropping. If Chazelle does miss, I think McDonough's almost probably in. I still think there's a chance for Babylon to rebound and Babylon to come out and this could become a populist type movie kind of like The Wolf of Wall Street where maybe critics were very divisive on it when it's released but after it, they see it a second time and it gets more public eyes on it, it can have a resurgence and could catch on. Could it get all the way back up to where its previous like number two Spawn director was? Probably not but I don't think Chazelle is completely dead yet for director. I'm not saying that you have him dead but as I've seen some other people completely make him go from two to off their top 10 list but keep in mind that wolf of wall street only got five nominations it got mm -hmm. picture director screenplay actor supporting actor it missed a lot of things that people thought it was going to get um and babylon i think will be will be similar i think it it's not going to do horribly but it's going to miss some things it's going to miss some things that people are probably going to really like yes i agree when it comes out people will go a little bit crazy for it and we'll be like oh my god this is the most insane thing ever but like keep in mind we're not <laughs> we're not academy voters um, yeah are we both gonna love this film probably yeah probably um but it's not gonna be for everyone it's really not but anyways, let's go over to your best picture list. I want to hear what's up this week, what's down this week. I'm very curious to see how things are moving around. And I got some feedback for you coming. So what's gone? Uh, the sun is gone. Uh, Sony Pictures Classic just moved its release date to after nominations. That does not very much help the older demographic for this crowd to get to lay eyes like we've previously said it could be a chance. I also dropped Wakanda Forever off my top 25 um, I get there's people who still have faith in this movie, but um, Picture is not a place for this movie. I don't think, personally, it's never 
really been in my eyes because I've been on the Avatar train. I've been more on the Maverick train or on the Elvis for the more populist type movies. But Wakanda's always been my fourth, my fifth, if you count Glass Onion as a uh, blockbuster type movie. But if you move into what I actually have in my top 25, uh, underneath the 20 spot, we have RRR, Bones and All, I Want to Dance with Somebody, Triangle of Sadness, and Decision to Leave. Five movies I don't really see making it to picture, but they're not completely dead. There's a avenue. Bones and All is probably the least likely of that group, but there's still, from what I've seen out there, a very committed fan base to that. But do I think the Oscar voters to that fan base? Probably not. Um, then we move to the top 20. The top 20 is where I can actually see some of these movies having a real shot in for picture. Uh, Empire Light, All Quiet on the Western Front, Emancipation are three movies where I think their route there is very, very, very small, but they're not completely dead yet. Uh, Empire Light could really hit with the older crowd, the crowd that wants to see the love of cinema per se. All Quiet on the Western Front is still a war movie. It still has those technical aspects. Emancipation is sight unseen. It's Apple's really only real contender. Plus, who knows, the Will Smith narrative could be this year and not three, four years down the line. Um, then we move into the top 17. Here's where we start to get some movies that I think could have a kind of solid case. Well, there's something really going against these movies. Uh, the Woman King, it's released it, as I said before. I feel like if this came out now, of uh, this and Wakanda Forever switches release dates, I think Woman King's an easy Best Picture nominee. Uh, it's getting a bunch of texts. Uh, and if they put Viola Davis in supporting, I think she would win. Um, Till is a movie that I think will have its fans, but also doesn't really have a package it has picture or not picture it has actress it has song and it has screenplay and still song and screenplay are not in my five they're barely in my 10 and then you have after sun a movie i previously said on the show i don't really see how it has a route but this could be what you mentioned for drive my car this could pop up on obama's favorite movies of the list this could yeah. win la this could win new york this could become the movie the critics just say, this is our pick, and we're manifesting. We're making this a reality. So for that, I didn't have it on my list last time we talked. It's now at 15. Then we move into the top 14. The top 14, all these movies, I feel like on a specific day, could get in the picture. Right now, I have The Whale at 14, and that's solely because I still have Butler winning actor. If I switch to Frasier, The Whale's in my best picture, and that and Elvis probably flip-flop spots. But because I have... Elvis and Butler winning actor, I have it above the whale. And we've mentioned this on the show. I don't want to say this every time we talk about the whale. I don't want to be a whale hater. I haven't seen the movie. But everyone who comes out of this movie solely talks about Frasier. They don't talk about this movie. They don't talk about the screenplay. Some people have mentioned Hong Chao. But overall, it's mainly we love Brendan Frasier. And that's it. Then we move to Glass Onion. This is just one that I would love to see show up. I just don't really see how it can Sure, Janelle Monet could get nominated. Sure, it's getting in the adapted. Production design, maybe. But overall, if the first one couldn't get in with as high praise as it had, yes, 2019 was a lot tougher of a year. But what indication does the Academy have to be like, okay, this time around, we got you? When they already have some other sequels they're giving love to. Uh, then we move up to my top 12. These are the movies I feel like are very, very, very much so. And out, just depends on the day. Pinocchio's at 12. Uh, I see this on Monday. Monday, I can fully decide, okay, this is Netflix's movie. This is not Netflix's movie. Uh, most likely, probably, because I'm going to do a double, not a, maybe a double feature, but I know I'm seeing these relatively close to each other, Pinocchio and Bardo. Bardo is what I have at 11 right now. Um, I still think there's a very good shot for this movie to be the big overperformer on Oscar morning where it could show up in director. It could show up in cinematography. Uh could show up an actor depending on how things bounce around in that category but at the moment i don't know i want to see this movie before i fully keep committing to it and i see it so shortly the reason why i switched it because now i have tar at 10 and even though you and i were not the biggest fans of this movie there's a lot of people out there who aren't the biggest fans of this movie there's still a lot of people who love this movie and adore this movie and this movie will get a lot of like they're making a ballot there's a lot of people gonna put this as their number one for picture their number one for director their number one for actress and I feel like if enough people have that, it can will its way into picture. On a preferential ballot, I think this movie will struggle a lot. But to get in for a nomination, I feel like it's looking better and better. Plus, this is focused as only horse in the race. Therefore, they can focus everything on this. Compared to Netflix, that I just mentioned had Bardo, Pinocchio, Knives Out, all in a row. If they focused on one movie, Netflix easily can get that movie in. But if they're trying to juggle three, 
I don't know how well it'll work for them. Because we've seen in years past, that third movie they try to push always struggles. Because the first one, they don't have to put any effort in. Power of the Dog, Roma. These are movies that the critics just do all the work for them. And then they put their focus in the second movie, like a Don't Look Up, like a Marriage Story, where they're like, okay, well, we don't have to put in as much work for this. We still have to push a little bit. And that third movie, the um, uh, Tick, Tick, Booms, uh, the two popes that they try to push, they just don't make it out. And that's what this year looks like. The normal Netflix three movie is the Netflix one movie this year. And they just don't know what to do with it. That brings us to our top nine. These are movies I feel pretty good about. She said Elvis Babylon is that next group where, yes, I could see a route for them falling out of picture. But at the moment, I see a pretty good thing. She said has supporting actors, adapted screenplay, maybe a score nomination. Elvis has the best actor win for me and multiple tech nominations. Babylon is still going to be the big bombastic kind of like Elvis type movie where maybe Elvis hurts Babylon in the long run just because they could be drawing the same type of crowds of someone who wants a very over-the-top hollywood s type movie. But Babylon still, as we've mentioned before, these late break or not late breakers, but late comers to the scene still usually get in. As we saw last year of Nightmare Alley, even though they're divisive, they still manage their way into picture. That brings us to our top six. And I think most of these six movies have a shot for winning picture, but at the minimum, they have a pretty good case to make picture. Uh, Maverick is at six. That's the one I feel like has the worst case to win picture. But I can see a world where Top Gun Maverick wins picture. It would piss a lot of people off. But there's a lot of people who would make happy. Um, Women Talking is at five. This is another one I think is pretty safe. I don't really see this going anywhere. Same with Banshees. Banshees feels pretty safe. I've seen some people say this could win picture. Personally, I wouldn't like that, but I can see it. Uh, Fablemans and Everything Everywhere is my, like, if my actual prediction for Best Picture isn't a reality. These are the two I'm deciding between what is actually winning. And as always, Way of Water is at one. Haven't seen this movie. No one's seen this movie. And therefore, it would not be smart. I mean, smart, you can argue, but it wouldn't be just to move this movie without any sort of reaction. If I say this is my number one in July, June, whenever we started this, they wouldn't make sense for me to take it away now in November just because people have seen Fable Mids or just because people have seen Banshees. I want to wait for people to see the actual Banshees, the ones in, in, with the Navi. Once they see them, I could be like, okay, this stays at one, or is this moving down to five, like a Maverick, where it's like, this is a tech juggernaut, just not a picture winner, or is this a complete James Cameron just wasted the last 15 years of his life and this isn't making picture? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you're, if nothing else, you are someone who is committed to uh to this it's like you uh you picked a number on the roulette board and you're riding it all the way right you're just gonna ride it until uh until the very end yeah i mean i I respect the integrity um but that said i mean my my case for why it's not winning remains um i mean they already had the chance to reward the first one they did not reward the first one i don't see why they would with this one at this point but, on the other hand, um, I do think that they could reward one of the next ones in the series. I just don't know about it being, uh, you know, the second one. Maybe the third one, because there are rumors that, you know, if they do make five, James Cameron might not direct the, the final two. He might just direct the first three. And if that's the case, he's winning. He's winning, director, at the very least. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I mean, I... I want you to see Bardo because I think it's really going to change your opinion of where this lands because, yes, it's a possible contender, but it's much closer to a 15 than it is to a 10. Um, otherwise, I mean, everything you said about After Sun is completely true. However, what you said about, like, oh, this could top Obama's list, this could uh, top the... It could do the trifecta the way that Drive My Car did. Maybe normally... But Tar exists this year. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think Tar being number 10, I get that you're not very hot on the film. Neither am I. But no bias, this film is a much stronger contender than we feel it is. And there are a lot of people who feel a lot warmer about it than we do. Because I know our issue with it is that the film's very cold. That's not the issue for most people. And most people are, are really enjoying it and find the film to be quite funny, actually. So... All that said, um, Tar is going to be the critics' push of the year. But After Sun, you make a great point with the, this could be pushed in by, um, you know, critics being like, we love this movie. We love it so much. And what you said about um, Elvis and Babylon, 
kind of gives me the weird feeling that like could babylon miss picture for elvis i think that's actually a possibility that only one of them makes it in and it's elvis instead of babylon i mean at the same time yeah paramount paramount pictures i'm gonna snort up the stars uh but otherwise i mean i i like your list i like that pinocchio is getting closer to the top 10 i want to see that in the top 10 someday here but yeah all all good points all around um i do think decision to leave might be a little bit lower than it actually is because i think it's got it's got a strong case for a director nomination it's got a strong case for an international win i think i think it might be a little bit higher there than 21 here but anyways uh we want to thank you all for tuning in to this episode of fantasy film ball um next week we get to talk about some of our most anticipated films of the year we're finally going to talk about pinocchio which is my second favorite movie of the year which you're just going to get to see you're going to be talking about your most anticipated movie of the year which is bardo which you're just going to be able to see this week which i saw today and i keep my thoughts on it guarded right now uh as well as bones and all so it's gonna be a jam-packed episode and i'm really looking forward to uh, to discussing all of those films dear god dylan if you don't like pinocchio the show is over we find out in about 48 hours wow okay but until then my name is matt and my name is dill and this is fancy film ball Thank you for tuning into this episode of Fancy Film Ball with Matt and Dill. Keep up to date with us on Twitter at @filmball. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. We even upload a video format of the podcast to YouTube if you want to see our faces. Thank you for listening to this episode of the show, and come back next week.